That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. Seen, whoa, who hasn't seen The Lion King? Anybody? Wow, sinner. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. You need to go home and watch The Lion King like, like tonight. Like that's a, that's a big deal. Whoa, oh my gosh. Hey, so check me out. We're doing this, we're doing this series called Mirror Mirror. And well, obviously like the reflection uh, for Lion King is, is why Janae picked that wonderful clip. Uh, but, but honestly, at the end of the day, this, this Mirror Mirror image, this identity thing, is a real thing for everybody, not just, not just you, not just kids in, in your grades or your peers. This image thing is a problem, an identity thing is an issue with everybody. It's like, man, who am I? How am I supposed to, how am I supposed to root my identity in? What am I supposed to root my identity in? For many of us, like, that's like the things that we do. That's like what we're, what we're good at, either the sports that we play or the, or the artsy-fartsy, as Janae says, things that, that we do, that's what we root our identity in. But Jesus, God, wants us to root our identity in him. And so this, this mirror, mirror image thing is God literally reminding us and us reminding ourselves, man, God wants us to know that we are literally made in the image of God, that everything inside and out is supposed to reflect him. And that's what we talked about. That's what we talked about last week. That's exactly what Janae hit on is that, man, we are made in the beautiful image of God and not just like in our physical person, but in how we function, which means like our tender heartedness, which means how we love other people, how we care for other people, our empathy for other people. All of those things are supposed to reflect who God is is so that when other people see us, Janae said it last week, sometimes we may be the only Bible people ever read. And God did that. God designed us with that purpose. But here's, here's the deal, right? Here's the deal. When God designed us, there obviously was something bad that happened that distorted or corrupted our perspective of the image that God made us to reflect. Does that make, does that make sense? Let me, let me say that again. When sin entered into the picture, God's image that he put inside of us was corrupted. It became blurry. So we no longer saw ourselves as God intended us to see ourselves. We began to see ourselves as, well, sin wanted us to see ourselves. And so the image that God wanted us to see in the mirror got distorted. It got corrupted. It got blurry. And, and so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how, how we perceive ourselves, our quote-unquote self-esteem, our self-image is so jacked up and why. Why our self-image and why so many of us either like hate ourselves or we think too highly of ourselves. Why that is the case. That's what we're going to talk about today. So today is going to be a little heavy, so just go with me. But we're also going to talk about how God reassembles that. How God, how God changes that. How God makes that blurry, messed up, distorted picture that you see right here and how God brings it back together and makes it whole again so that we see ourselves correctly. That's the whole point. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we talk about that, anybody remember Iron Man 3? Anybody? Iron Man 3 kind of gets like thrown back. Is Iron Man 3 anybody's favorite Iron Man? Anybody? Okay, great. This is good. All right, for some of you, Janae, it's your favorite Iron Man, isn't it? It's one of Janae's favorite Iron Man. So Iron Man 3, Janae and I just, just re-watched it the other day because I, I thought to myself, man, I'm, I think that has to do with our lesson. Anybody remember the premise of Iron Man 3? Yes. It's okay. I'm going to tell you anyway. So, so, so check me out. So this is what happened. So Avengers, the first Avengers had just happened. Aliens had first entered the picture of Marvel and, and Iron Man and the Avengers had defeated these aliens. We know the aliens to be of Thanos and Thanos' universe and all that stuff. He didn't know that yet, but he was so scared in Iron Man 3 because he expected the aliens to come back. Right. That's that's how it starts. Like he expects the aliens to come back. He's like, this isn't this isn't over. 
And Iron Man is really kind of like messed up, not just like in his heart physically, like we know at the end of the movie he has surgery and all that stuff, but like, but like mentally, psychologically, his, his perspective of himself and everything else is all kinds of jacked up at the beginning of this movie. And as a result of Iron Man's fear, he begins to create all of these Iron Men. That's the, that's the cool like picture at the end when he's blowing them all up after he saves Pepper and all that good stuff, right? And so... Uh, and so we get, we get to Iron Man, but at the root of Iron Man's like, kind of like brokenness within this movie is his pride. And so you remember how Hap like, gets blown up in the middle of the movie? Like, does anybody remember Hap, you know, Iron Man's best yes. friend? Okay, great, fantastic. So, so Hap, Hap gets blown up in the middle of the movie, and, and Iron Man gets upset, and his pride comes to the front of the picture. And he literally looks at, looks at the reporter, and he tells the reporter, here's my address. If the Mandalorian wants some, like, here's where I live come get me, and then Mandalorian blows up everything. Mandarin. You know what I'm talking about. Mandarin, gosh. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, the Mandarin, the crazy guy that we see later on in the other movies. Anyway, so the Mandarin, the Mandarin ends up getting blown up, right? Thank you so much, of course. Only students could correct me in this area of life. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the Mandarin, the Mandarin blows up Hap. Tony Stark's pride comes forth, and then what happens? His house gets blown up, right? And then everything, everything falls. Tony Stark's pride shows up, and then, well, fall comes, right? Pride before, before the fall. And it's this beautiful picture of how, like, Tony Stark literally has to build everything from the ground up, including, including his own, like, identity. He has to let pride go, and he has to realize, okay, like, this is bigger than me. Because at the end of the day, like, he, he, lost, he lost Pepper for a little while, too, because his pride got in the way, and all he cared about was himself and his own pride and nobody else. And so we see this picture of pride come into, into his life, but if we're being honest, pride enters all of our lives, and, and here's, here's why. Here's why. Genesis chapter 3 explains to us how our self-image became distorted in the very first place. We know Adam and Eve were, were made in the image of God, and then we know that God placed them in the garden, and he gave them a few commands, but one of those commands was to cultivate the garden, aka take care of the garden and spread the Garden of Eden all throughout the rest of the world. God wanted the Garden of Eden to be everything. He's like, cultivate this, multiply it, make it good, because you are very good, because you are made in my image. And then Satan enters the picture because God gave them one command. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan, speaking through the serpent, the, the, the serpent tells Eve that if she ate the forbidden fruit, that her eyes would be open and she would be like God. And then in Genesis chapter six or chapter three, verse six, the woman, it says, was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful. And its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. And this very first act by our very first parents put themselves above God. In this very moment that we read about in Genesis chapter 3, they decided themselves what was right from wrong. This revealed their pride to think of themselves more highly than they should. Hey, we know better than God. We know what is right from wrong. We know that he told us not to eat from this tree, but we are going to do it anyway. Pride enters into the picture and it's the result. Its result is the fall. It goes against what Romans 12, 3 encourages us and tells us to do. It says, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, which means that we should be evaluating ourselves, we, meaning we should be looking ourselves in the mirror and being like, uh, how, how, how am I? Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. And so a corrupted self-image, the first thing a corrupted self-image means is that pride rules. See, what, what sin did was sin took our eyes off of God and it put our eyes honestly on ourselves. We begin to take pride in the things that we have and the gifts and the talents that God has given us as if, as if it's all of us, as if we did that, as if our good deeds and our working out and our effort and our work has done every good thing that has been produced as a result. 
Mitch and I were literally just talking the other day, like on, on Tuesday morning, and he was talking about this song, this Drake song, that, uh, that you probably all know. It's, it's, called, uh, it's called All Me, and it's literally that song. He's, Drake's, the like, chorus says, came up, that's all me, stay true, that's all me, no help, that's all me, all me, for real. But that's like, that's, that's the theme of our, of our society. That's the theme of, like, of who we are as people, is like, man, like, I, I did that. Like, I want credit for that. And God's like, no, like, I, I did that. See, this corrupted self-image of pride is played out even after the fall in one of the most dramatic Bible stories ever. Janae talked about King Nebuchadnezzar the other week, but, like, King Nebuchadnezzar in, in Daniel chapter 4 he literally walked on his rooftop on his palace in, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, and he says this. He's like, look at this great city of Babylon. He's like, look at my city. Look at what I've done. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. This heart and this attitude of King Nebuchadnezzar that most of us have is, is a dangerous heart and attitude to have because what God did after that statement was he stripped everything away. Whenever we begin to look at the things of the, of the world and believe them to be of our own doing, guys, watch out. What makes sin, honestly, so, so dangerous is the fact that we are now using these God-given gifts. Like God put, put his qualities and put his gifts within us. And he says, hey, like you're made in my image, so I'm going to give you my gifts and my powers and my qualities. And what man has done because of the distorted self-image is they have used God-given gifts and powers and qualities and used them to insult the God that gave them to us. Wow. We use God-given gifts and qualities and powers to insult the one that gave them to us. The question is, how long do we think we can use said gifts given to us by God to insult him? How long can we use our gift of leadership to lead others to do everything else except follow Jesus? That was, that was me, by the way. How long can we use musical talents to play and sing at school, to rap and sing songs that don't glorify God, but not use them for his own glory and his own church? How long can we use our tech skills to play games on the internet or video games and not use those skills in, in tech or talk to Dan or use them on Sunday morning? How long can we use the gifts that God has given us to insult him? And our lack of willingness is either a result of, of pride, which is the first corrupted self-image means, or, or because we think we're above using those God-given gifts for God. Or they're the result of the second corrupted self-image, which is shame or, or low self-esteem. And that's the second thing. A corrupted self-image means shame haunts us. After the fall, Adam and Eve now felt ashamed of themselves. Their, their self-image went from like, oh my gosh, like I'm prideful. I, I can tell myself what, what is right from wrong to like, oh crap, I realize I, I missed the mark and now I'm ashamed. I realize I'm naked and I have to cover up. It went from like pride to low self-esteem immediately. And that's, that's the self-corrupted image. Shame. At that moment, Genesis chapter 3 verse 7 says, At that moment their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. See, becoming aware of their nakedness meant that they now understood what shame was. God says in Romans 8, 1, and we'll talk about this later, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation, which is no shame, to those who are in Christ Jesus. God did not make us to be beings that had shame within us. That's not how he designed us. That's not how God purposed us. Humility, yes. Shame, no. It's not of God. It's not what he placed in us. It's not how he designed us. Adam showed his sense of shame when he responded to God as God came into the garden to walk and to spend time with Adam and Eve as he did every single day. He said, he said to God, God, Adam would say, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. So it started this like cycle, which was like sin, shame, and then fear. And, it, and this cycle continues, and it continues in, in our own lives, right? Like we sin, we miss the mark, 
we're, we're ashamed, and then, like, and then we respond out of fear. Whatever our next action is, it is fearful, whether or not that fear comes through pride or that fear comes through us running away. And shame was a result of Adam understanding that he fell short of what and who God designed him to be. And as a result, he looked down on himself. He despised himself. Actually, he probably hated himself. And this is that oftentimes, oftentimes the root of our shame and fear. The expectations of others that we try so hard to meet, whether it's our coaches, our parents, family members, teachers, so on. And for so many of us, we, we thrive at trying to meet those expectations. We love the pressure. Others of us hate it so much that we just give up because we don't even want to face it. But for both parties, whether or not you thrive under it or you run away from it, for both parties, it's impossible to please everybody. And so when we fail to let someone do down, when we fail to let someone down, we, we either work really hard to prove ourselves or we hide. And it's even worse when we feel like that with God, when we feel like we've let God down. And that's why so many of us, we come back into church, and when we come back in after, like, after a fall or after a season of being away where we know we weren't living right, that's why like, when we come back in, we come back in either full throttle or we leave, and we don't come back at all because we feel like everybody can see our sin and our shame and our nakedness. Both responses are terrible responses because God doesn't work that way. Serving more isn't going to get you into heaven, and staying away is only going to allow the enemy to isolate you, to get you by yourself, away from the community of believers that is around you, and then he attacks. He goes on the offensive. He wants to get you alone. And so don't do either or. If you're honest with yourself, you do, what, you do what you do, you serve more, you run away because you feel like God no longer, no longer wants you. And I'm here to tell you that God wants you just as you are, just like you are. And so this low self-esteem thing for many of us, this shame thing that many of us feel, I'm going to be honest with you, it's not all bad. God didn't design us to be this way, but it's not all bad. Hear me out. Hear me out. It's the start of God's image in us being, well, reassembled. Genuinely. We, like Adam, need to understand that we miss the mark. We, we miss the mark on a daily basis. So here's, here's God's standard for us, and, like, and here's where we are. We miss the mark. It's like an arrow that misses the middle of the bullseye every single time. We miss the mark. There's an understanding that is necessary when it comes to this low self-image. There's an understanding that is necessary for true repentance. There's this story that puts it on perfect display in Luke 18. Jesus told this story to the people that were around him. See, two men went, went to the temple to pray, Luke 18 tells us, and one was a Pharisee, which meant he was a religious leader. He was a, he was a good guy. He was righteous by all men's sake. He did everything the right way. He prayed the right way. He paid his taxes. He was like holier than thou. And both of these guys went to the temple to pray. You had a religious leader and a Pharisee, and then you had a tax collector who was like scum. Nobody liked the tax collectors. They basically collected taxes from their own people for the Romans and then skimmed a little bit off of the top. They took more than what they were supposed to take. And so you got these two guys in this, in this picture that Jesus is telling, in this story that Jesus is telling. And he's like, both of these guys go to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee prays like this. He says, God, thank you that I'm not like other people. Thank you that I'm not a cheater, a sinner, or an adulterer, certainly not like that tax collector. I do all this. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood there, and, and this is what the tax collector said. He couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. And instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, and he said, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And Jesus tells us this. He says, I tell you, this sinner... Not the Pharisee returned home justified, which means just as if I'd never sinned before God. Before those, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhausted. To start seeing ourselves correctly, as Christ intended for us to see ourselves, we must first realize the weight of our sin. We must first realize like the hell that ensues when our sin entered into the picture. And we must ask God to help us recognize our need for a savior. And that savior is Jesus. And that's why it's so important that we spend time alone with God on a daily basis. 
Time with God does three things. It develops humility. And so the more time we spend with God, the more we recognize how broken and messed up we are. And humility does a few things. It considers others better than themselves. It recognizes that all of our gifts and talents come from God in the first place. And humility is a willingness to use those gifts to serve God for his purpose and for his glory. Time with God also breaks the cycle of sin. We talked about how sin led to shame and then it led to fear. Well, the new cycle that's created is that sin then leads to repentance, which means that we turn 180 degrees away from our sin. And then we turn to Jesus and Jesus restores us. We at that point no longer live as slaves to sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means that low self-esteem rooted in shame is no more. Last thing is that time with God restores our perspective. Romans 12, two says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think, and then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Guys, I want to let you know that like this, this whole thing, like how we see ourselves is so ridiculously important. Like it's, it's important to the fact, there's a story with these balloons, I'll tell you later. Uh, it, it's, it's important to the fact that like God wants us to see ourselves as he sees us. But, but honestly, for most of us, for all of us, actually, when we're disconnected from God, there's only two perspectives that we get. It's either we're prideful and we think more of ourselves than we ought to or we think less of ourselves than what God intended us to think of. And we hate ourselves, we despise ourselves because we're shamed of who we are. And so disconnection from God either leads to shame and we think lower or it leads to pride and we think way too high of ourselves. Yeah, I know it'll be interesting for the Spanish church to get out here. But here's the deal. When we are connected to God, and he holds us because we are connected, then we stay steady. Our identity stays hidden in Christ. And what's true about Jesus, we're reminded that it's true about us, that we are righteous and worthy because of Jesus, that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But if we are disconnected from him, you're either going to get one or the other. You can't have both. You can't have it all. And so I would, I would encourage you guys, I would encourage you to spend time with Jesus. Stay connected to Jesus. Because if not, how you view yourself, how you view yourself will be so corrupted it won't be how God intended it to be. And he wants you to stay connected to him so that you see yourself as he made you. Guys, I don't, I don't know where you're at right now in your life. I don't know what's going on in your world and I don't know how you see yourself right now. I don't, only, only you know that. But I'm willing to bet that some of you in this room probably either hate yourselves, you're shame ridden, And there's others of you that probably see yourselves as way too great than what you are. I don't know. If I were to bet, it would probably be more so on the former than the latter. But if you want to see yourself as God sees you, then he says, man, spend time with me. Spend time in my word. Spend time talking to me. Practice my presence. Pray to me. Put your phone away. Put music away. Spend time with the God of the universe because he wants you to. I want you to. And I want you to know him so that you can know yourself the way that he knows you. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your love for us. Man, thank you that you've created us with purpose, that you say you are worthy, that you say we're enough because of Jesus, that you call us righteous and love sons and daughters. Jesus, I pray that we would be intentional about spending time with you, that we would be intentional about being connected to you, and that as a result of being connected to you, God, our self-image, 
our self-image would be restored to what it is that you designed it to be. God, we love you and we thank you so much. And we pray, God, that your perspective overrules in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.